what's this? It's like a, it's like a holiday we never heard about. <laughs> it isn't it. Um, I don't know. What's it? It's it says Wednesday, and I have no idea. Yeah. All right. Welcome to. Uh, did I already share my content? Share your desk. You can see it on your end. You see everything? Okay. All right. So uh, I'll minimize that. All right. So we were actually just discussing the schedule, but I'll get that on video for everybody else. The uh, This class now has three weeks of content left. And um, we, we actually, because I took out one of the network, I was going to do network in two weeks, but I did it in one because uh, ArcGIS Pro currently doesn't have the ability to like build a network yet, so we, we did that. So you probably noticed that we're like a little bit ahead of the syllabus. Um, so I had to stick something else in, and what I did was I stuck something in that I take it out, but it's a technology that changes a lot, and so there's lots of, of things to say about it, and that, that's what we're going to cover today is uh, is WebGIS and. Um, we do have a course just in WebGIS, but today's lecture is kind of tuned. Lecture and, and what we'll do in the lab, it's kind of tuned more toward using it as a, as a tool rather than like trying to build your own uh, web maps and, and displaying your own web maps, which is probably where it's going anyway. Uh, but uh, And then the other thing that this couples really well with is the final project. And so I wanted to present this and then we'll we'll discuss the the final project because you'll be able to. What I want to do with the final project is um, <clears throat> one of the ways to turn it in to just turn it in uh, will be to just turn it in as a, as a web map. Uh, maybe in the future that'll be the only way to turn it in, but uh, uh, but we'll uh, talk about that. <clears throat> we'll talk about the final project. Uh, Kind of like after the the like right after the break. That's what we'll do. So so one of the assignments is actually to come up with one of the parts of today's assignment is to come up with a paragraph about what you want to do for your final project. So before before you can do that, we'll detail a little bit more what that's all about. Um, okay. So I uh, I do have. A, um, a lecture. Whoa, that's kind of colorful. Planned. All right, so uh, let's hear the basics of web mapping and web GIS. And this, uh, this is, I mean, honestly, a little bit light in terms of uh, uh, the number of slides and the content. So we'll be doing some some demos and, and talking about. Uh, what you can do with uh, with online GIS these days, uh, but we're going to start out with just talking about what it is and, and kind of a brief history of the technology uh, behind it, and then uh, and then we'll transition that into some of the the tools and what you can do uh, at least in the ESRI world. There are there are other alternative tools, but a lot of them work using the same fundamental technologies and uh, and uh, um, and, and have similar abilities. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I'm using these terms, WebGIS, uh, which is a newer term, uh, and web mapping today. Right? So web mapping, like I said, it's something that we already have a, a course in here. Uh, we, we actually talk about uh, programming web maps in that course. Uh, and uh, so uh, today we're not going to we're not going to talk about programming. We're talking about how web mapping works, and we're going to explore uh, as part of the lab. We're going to explore getting our data onto the web so that other people can can share and utilize it. And also, uh, we're going to talk about how ArcGIS Pro itself has been built as a uh, as an interface to uh, the the, uh, the the world of web mapping. You can actually create a web map right in ArcGIS Pro and share it with people. So, uh, in general, the uh, the term here, web mapping, 
It's the process of using maps delivered by geographic information systems uh, in the World Wide Web. So we're going to break that down a little bit. What's a geographic information system? Like what can a GIS, what are, what are some of the things a GIS can do? Yeah, can show you places. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, so it so it uh, it can display uh, representations of the world we live in that are that are in a data format. That's what uh, that's what. Uh, like I'm thinking of ArcGIS Pro as as the example of the GIS system that we use in this class. Right. So we can do some analysis with it. Uh, we can use. It usually contains a, a set of tools to do analysis inside of of it. It's software package, and it is software, right? So GIS uh, is software that is. A, pro a computer program, basically. And some people would expand GIS to mean also the like the entire system, like the people that use it and, and things like that. But fundamentally, we're talking about the, the software. Yeah, go ahead. Well, what I'm, you just came out and stated, the system is there, uh, meaning all parts of the country to make this thing work, like uh, system names is a... Uh, this is a system that's understood by everyone that's going there, or do you have to have a system that everybody recognizes, and just be a system that you create for one thing, like Ezra, you know, the, the uh, SQR that you did last week, that's a type of system too, isn't it? Right, well, QGIS is, a, is another software package for doing it. Um, and, uh, SQL is just a, it's like a, a spatial programming language for asking questions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so a GIS can can use a spatial programming language like uh, spatial SQL, uh, or um, or it can it can interface and, and run those tools in another way. There is a, I, I included a, a definition that's widely used and accepted here, uh, where uh, a, a GIS has the components necessary to capture, store, manipulate, analyze, and manage, and present all types of geographical data. Okay, so that's that's a common, commonly accepted and used um, uh, definition of, of a GIS. Right. So it's we could think of even if it's not the entire system, like we could think of the people that use it and and, and other external elements. But the center of the system is a software package that um, that that does these things, right? So um, when we say that web mapping displays data served up, uh, sorry, delivered by a geographic information system, what we're doing is saying that some of what makes it makes a GIS software package work is actually running the web map. So we're, we're not talking about just somebody that, that, that took a, um, the, the drew a map and created an image and put it on the internet. Because you can do that, right? Like, you can put any images on the internet. Um, technically speaking, I guess that would be web mapping. If they, if they used the GIS to first create the map, they exported the map, and they put it on the internet. It doesn't do anything. It's just a map. That sits there. It's like an image at that point. Uh, but uh, specifically, what we're going to, what we're talking about today, are maps that uh, that almost feel as though they're they are a GIS system. We've seen these kinds of things. We've all used we've used Google. You guys have all used Google Maps before, right? And uh, and and other other online tools like that. So. Um, what happens is that the data that's displayed in the web map, the web map is a central component of web mapping, is served by a server. 
And that <laughs> server has some of the same computer code that uh, a desktop GIS would have. It has the ability to, to basically spit out um, information. If we, if we take ArcGIS Pro, for example, and we kind of like split it up into its components, some of those components are for displaying geographic information, and some of those components are for uh, storing the GIS information, uh, reading it into its memory, and symbolizing it. Those are the kind of those are the kind of components that are part of the server, whereas the uh, parts that are concerned with putting it in the right place and and, and uh, some of the symbolization uh, are things that are done on the client. Notice like, the part about symbolization. Sometimes that's done on the server. Sometimes it's done on the client. There's different uh, different ways to do that. Yeah, go ahead. So the uh, system is used to join all information together, as you're saying. The system is how it brings all the information and tie it to the digital picture. As you said, you can produce the picture or not, but you use that to join data that is collected to a specific geographical location to explain what it is digitally. Yeah, I mean, I think that's... Kind of broader than than what I'm than I'm what I'm saying right, right now. I'm specifically talking about the software part of it that is running on. So so think when we use ArcGIS Pro, it's all running on the same computer. But if we could break the components into two, uh, some of the components are concerned with storing, analyzing, manipulating, uh, querying the data. Those would be things that that are done on the server. On the client, those components are concerned with um, displaying and um, interacting with the user, displaying data for a user and interacting with the user. And then there is communication between those two uh, computers. So that's what that's what happens in the World Wide Web. And we'll get into, we'll talk about that in greater detail. That's, that's what we're going to do. So um, the next logical step from that, or not necessarily Web mapping by itself is a is a great end and it's it's useful in a lot of uh, cases. Like if somebody just wants to show uh, a map on the web and have a little bit of interactivity or even a lot of interactivity, uh, anybody think of some web mapping sites that you've that you've gone to in the past? What are some things that you can do online now where you interact with a map? I could think. Uh, yeah. Access by. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, Sarah said census data. I don't know how well that goes uh, through. Federal uh, flood layer. There's now a, 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 a web map that where you can zoom into your house and see the actual flood map down to your house level. Right. Based on last week. No. Yep. Yeah. No one has a bunch of web maps. Uh, you can also, uh, like, you know, people that are looking for houses can find houses on the internet, and uh, people that are um, so like looking for stores, them yeah, looking for store, store right? Uh, yeah, where's right. where's that's what you can do in Google Maps. Mm -hmm. yep, look for stores, look for anything. Uh, those are all great examples. So um, the uh, the next logical extension, though, is to take the entire or a, a big chunk of what you can do sitting in a GIS and basically ask ask any sort of question. Uh, and so, as more and more functionality uh, becomes available through the client-server relationship, in other words, I have a client. And I can request information from the from the server. At some point, if I can request any sort of information from from any data that exists on the server, then I can replicate the entire GIS system uh, in that model. I don't have to be at a desktop. It's distributing. That's what that means there. It's distributing the information system so that uh, it's not just that everything doesn't need to be just at a single. A machine in order for it to, to operate. So we can do 
uh, things like capture, store, manipulate, analyze, manage our GIS data from any computer. We just need we just need to have the right software tools on both ends to interact with uh, the um, the data. And what makes that possible? There's a few things that make it possible. One of the biggest things is uh, is uh, the in the integration between the two and creating standards for how information will be passed from different uh, different computers. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the history and then a little bit about how it's done. So first off, we're going to talk about web maps. Um, so web maps are things that you view usually on your browser, but uh, there's lots of other things. When I say browser, you know what I'm talking about? Web browser, Google Chrome, and whatnot. Um, all right. So, uh, Dr. Ray, yeah. There's a web map, and I'm not seeing the front of it. They had to dumb it down so that everybody can use it. Because right now, as technicians and uh, people that come out of your classes, they don't want to have a big thing. What they're trying to do is open up so the common man can get in there and find out they have a few things. But they don't have enough of us around to do the stuff that they really need. So it's really trying to open up so the thing. Yeah, so I mean, one of the ways that I would view it is that a web map needs to be uh, usable and accessible by, you know, just a, just a, well, whatever you view as the consumer of the web map. So if it's if it's a web map for finding WalMarts or if it's a web map for uh, for figuring out the best uh, route to take uh, on a public transportation network, then you need to like make it so that that's the only thing it does. So, uh, but a web GIS is the ability to do GIS analysis, which does often take uh, somebody with the skills in uh, doing GIS analysis. Um, it's just that now we've separated out the computer that's, you know, the computers are, are specializing in the different components that they run. So back, back here to web mapping, um, when we have a web map, uh, we can compare it to a, uh, a, a body. Uh, web maps have different components that interact with each other. They're intertwined. Um, and, uh, you know, we all know about the, uh, here that we've got the digestive system. Uh, here we've got the uh, nervous system. And here we've got the uh, circulatory system. And they they interact with each with each other and make the the body uh, a complete um, a complete entity. Okay. So in sim in similar ways, uh, web maps have uh, an an anatomy. So web maps have have data, and lots of times the data, just like with a uh, just like with a with a map that we might bring up in GIS. Sometimes there's more than one set of data. Okay, there's more than one thematic layer. We refer to these uh, things that we've, uh, that we've done in this course as uh, thematic elements. So uh, we also have ways to, to style, ways to, to, to analyze, and ways to, uh, to manipulate the data in a, in a web map. The, uh, we can we can query and ask questions uh, in a web map. So how is a web map different from a digital map? Uh, and basically, what, I'm, what I mean by digital map here is a uh, is a, that is a is a map created in a desktop environment. So the they're actually converging. They're becoming more and more uh, similar, uh, but a uh, a desktop map isn't going to be accessible to the internet. That's one of the primary differences. And um, uh, a web map is basically like a digital map. It's not just like a digital map. It's a kind of digital map. Um, we all, we've all, I, these are some examples I came up with, but I already talked about OpenStreetMap and, and maps. So here's a shot of, this is ArcGIS. This is ArcMap. It's the older version of ArcGIS Pro. Well, 
Not it's it's a uh, the ArcGIS Pro replaced Arc Arc Map. So um, one of the components of ArcGIS Pro is that it it kind of blurs the line between a desktop map and a web map. It gives us the ability to take our our desktop data and put it into the web. So uh, ArcMap kind of started this process, but it's it's really tightly integrated now, and that's one of the, the that's one of the demos that we'll do uh, today. We'll talk about. So is it just a net saying this right and type our program and going into a local computer and rather you use the web, which is not actually you don't have to use security to write code for a local system. Well, we're not going to talk about writing code other than as an abstract idea. We're not going to we're not writing any code or talk about writing code here in this in this course. Yeah. But um, but yeah, if you yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, so one of the earliest uh, mapping tools uh, that was a commercial product was called MapQuest. Anybody remember MapQuest? <laughs> right. So um, what happens? Like, could you like grab the map and move the map around when MapQuest first came out? I don't know if it's still right. So it, you see these little, um, you see this little, this little bar up here that says North. You actually had to click on that, and then the whole page would reload, and the map would be updated to be the um, the next map up in 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 a set of of maps. So now it would go. I don't know if it would move up the whole way. I forgot. I think it would move up like part of the way, like halfway. So to to pan around, you'd hit these little buttons. Um, you could you could click and get information. Uh, you could zoom in and zoom out, but if you if you zoomed in or out, the whole page would reload at a different uh, scale. Um, and uh, it it wasn't really interactive, other than you kind of had this uh, click to identify uh, ability. Um, in contrast, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you couldn't. You couldn't. You couldn't do this. Is what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, we, we we refer to this as a slippery map. We'll talk about the history of the slippery map today. But uh, the the slippery map is a uh, well, relative relative to this is a recent invention. All right. So now when I uh, when I move around, if I um, if I look uh, in the uh, developer tools here. More tools, developer tools. As I move this map around, um, I'm going to go to network. Yeah, network. As I move this map around, you see there's more and more uh, network traffic happening. What's happening is that um, I'm getting a, a new image as I move dynamically. Uh, so, uh, whereas here, the only time I would actu actually get a new image is when I hit this button, it would make a request to get a new image. But they're both fundamentally happening in a similar way. And that is through this process of a computer, a PC, what we call a client, making a request for a web page, and then that, that uh, web page coming, that uh, information coming back. What's actually sent to the server when we make a request for a web page? Like when you when you type in www.usm.edu and press enter, what's happening? Well, there's a request that gets sent out to the internet and it says, "I'm requesting the content at www.usm.edu." I'm requesting that information. What what then happens? Well, it reaches a server. And that's uh, based on the address. So that's that's a universal resource locator. That's, in other words, that we call that a URL. So when we create a URL 
we're making a request out to the World Wide Web to a specific computer, and what's at the end of that, um, or what's servicing that request, is a computer that's going to return to us information. Typically, if it's just a web page, we're going to get HTML coded data back. So you can see uh, here, these are all individual requests that are being made out, and they they don't look like uh, requests that we uh, that we would um, that we'd be able to read, but it's still it's still a URL. This is for I just opened one of them. I don't I don't even know why this is coming back, but this is this is one of the requests that it's making uh, to this uh, to the server. It's getting back that sort of data. Okay. So not all requests back are simple HTML pages. That was one of the first things that happened in history was that. Um, when we sent out a, well, we're skipping into the history of the web, so we're, we're, there's probably another course on the history of the web, but um, that's not this course. So originally, you know, computers were out there waiting for requests. We we send out a URL, which hits the server and returns uh, HTML, which the browser then loads and displays on a page. Okay. Uh, so we, we call the computer that accepts the request a server, and we call the uh, computer that sends out the request a client. And the request is in the form of a URL, universe, universe, Uniform Resource Locator. So one way can, we can think of all of these servers on the web is as resources. <coughs> one server can actually supply many different resources, and that's why you get URLs that become so uh, verbose, right? We've got the, if we look at the components of a, a URL, what's the first part? www.usm.edu part. That is going to, that's just the part that references a specific server. All the rest of it afterward is asking for a specific resource on that server. So typically we have, uh, a, a, a universal resource locator has a schema, which is whether or not we're accessing it using HTTP, which is the most common, HTTP or HTTPS. And then the, uh, uh, the, the location, the, the, this is calling it the authority, but the actual server itself, and then the path to that resource. And then we can also have a question mark with a bunch of queries. So, the location for a specific bit of information might be a very specific URL, might be very long. So we're going to look at some URLs here in a second for accessing specific GIS data or geographic data. All right, so that's one of the main ways that data gets pushed around the, the web is, is using the URL. And it's not just about, um, it's not just about loading web pages. It's about getting all sorts of data. So when we use web mapping or web GIS, we need to find out where that resource is, and we need to find out how to interact with that resource in order to get it to work. Now, lucky for us, there's lots of clients that are already designed for interacting with different resources. HTTP, I mean, sorry, um, HTML is one particular type of resource for displaying a web page. Clients know how to display a web page using HTML. But GIS data, what does it, what gets returned when we request GIS data or when our client requests GIS data? Well, it can request images. We already, you should have already known that, right? I mean, you browse, you look at Facebook or Instagram, one of the things that's being returned from uh, from servers with, with lots of resources are images. In fact, we can think of an image as a single resource. So when I, I, could, I could type in a URL and get an image out. You know, we, uh, you, you, can, you can do that. You guys have probably all used uh, uh, cute kittens, right? In the internet to find pictures of, uh, of cats. 
So you can you can right click here and say open link a new tab and you can get oh that's still not the it's still not the oh copy open image a new tab. So this is just the URL to that that cute kitty, right? The the URL right there. So so that's the URL, and that's a unique URL just to get that tag, right? Uh, and uh, and and our web, our browser knows how to display just an image. I don't know if that's really a cute cat or not. All right, so. Um, we just display a picture of a cute kitty, but think about um, images. Think about a map or a portion of a map, right? So we could we could create a, a software system that that ran on a server that was waiting for requests to create a map, and those those requests would come in, and they might specify, "Hey, I want to see this map, but I only want to see this portion of the map." And then it would return that portion of the map back. I mean, that portion of the map back to the user as an image. Or it might say there might be one out there that said, "Hey, I've got some data here. I, I, I'm running it on a server, and I'm waiting for people. I'm waiting for URLs to come in. And the URL, the way that the URL is formed, is going to tell me about what type of data you want or what part of the data you want. Uh, and uh, it might return things like points, lines, or polygons back through the, the system uh, with, their, with or without their attributes, or even rasters. So the client software requests images, the uh, data displays it. So it's responsible for collecting information from the user and converting the request uh, for data, so it's responsible for, for actually formulating the request. Once it receives the data back, it's responsible for displaying or, or reporting or, or showing that data. And server software running on the, the server, it handles requests from the clients. Sometimes, you know, more commonly now, there are servers that are just constantly broadcasting data. We call that a stream. Uh, then the but uh, the server serves up that data as a response to a request. Now, uh, GIS analysis can be done on both the client and the server. So kind of blurring the line between that, but we could say if we make a request for some part of di uh, data, we're doing something like, or we're doing something like spatial SQL, we're making a request to a server and getting back some data. We might be doing some GIS analysis just in that. We might say, "Show me all of the, uh, show me all the restaurants in this location." In fact, that's, I mean, that's really what happens when we go to Google Maps and we say restaurants or WalMarts. So, what's happened is that. Um, is that when I did that, this client, uh, the, the software program that's loaded, Google Maps, made a request out to a service that knew where, that knew where different features were that I wanted, and it, and it made a query to that data and returned back to the client the location of all those restaurants. The client then decided to, or not decided, it didn't decide, it, but it was programmed, to show all those locations using this particular icon. And if I want to see additional information, it will display the additional information that came back with that um, dot uh, here in this panel. Okay. With, uh, with, that, uh, with that dot, it will show up in that panel. OK, so um, a web browser is a common client so software application. And we know that we can stick a URL in here, but lots of times when it loads a web page, it's uh, 
dispatching and receiving information from lots of different URLs. That's what's being shown on this side. All right. Um, at first, it was just a simple, you requested a resource, you got back the resource. Um, and then what, what happened was that uh, in uh, the mid-90s, JavaScript was invented. And JavaScript had the ability to uh, make a web page interactive, uh, to move elements on the page based on user interaction. So that was, that was, a firm, that was one big development. Okay. Uh, the, to, to move or change elements on a page based on user interaction. Uh, now, uh, at first, uh, that, that seemed uh, pretty neat, but um, oh, by the way, JavaScript is a computer software code that, that the browser reads. So when the browser hands back an HTML page, it can also hand back uh, some code that it runs to interact with that page. That's what JavaScript is. Is that why you can't open certain like documents or files or whatever unless you have Java? Because Peter won't run it and doesn't have that code. Yeah, so so Java and JavaScript are actually two fairly different technologies that sh that share a similar syntax. Mm -hmm. So um, so Java, what what, what it is is. It, it does work in a similar way. It's, it's a client, I mean, well, Java on the web is a client server technology, but Java itself uh, is kind of like the web browser. It's, it kind of fits into the same thing where it's requesting uh, code from a server, and the code comes, and then the, your, your Java interpreter on your computer uh, runs it and executes it. Uh, but yeah, Java is a, a computer programming language. Okay. Uh, JavaScript is also a computer programming language, uh, but it's, well, it is used for a few other things now, but uh, it's primarily used for interacting with browser elements. Uh, so when, when, you, when your browser makes a uh, request to a server and gets back an HTML page, that HTML page can either contain some JavaScript that says, hey, when the user presses this button, do something, uh, go somewhere else, uh, turn this button brown when the user hovers over it. Those are uh, those are all examples of something JavaScript might do. Uh, and, uh, and and yeah, uh, yeah, interprets and executes the code in the browser. All right. Um, there is a, a standard that, that got created along with JavaScript. It's called JavaScript Object Notation, JSON. And JavaScript Object Notation is a, um, is a text format that allows you to describe data. That's, simply put, that's, that's what it is. But it's a format, so it's, it is human readable because it's, um, it's written right in text. I'll show you some example of, of, uh, of that here real quick. So um, here is the, uh, you guys know what Maris is? I'm not sure if I've talked about it. I have talked about this in this class, right? So Maris is run by uh, the State of Mississippi IHL board. Um, and it stands for the Mississippi Automated Resource Information System, which sounds kind of fancy, but basically it's uh, it's a it's a it's a GIS data repository um, for the state of Mississippi. So you can go there and you can look, and they have a bunch of data for the state of Mississippi. They also have an office where they you know they, they gather the, the data. Uh, and uh, here, what they've done is there are a bunch of, of, of what they call REST endpoints. REST endpoints are resource endpoints. So this, this link here that says brown fields, this represents the interface, the web interface, to that, um, uh, to that web resource. So if I, if I click it, this is the endpoint for the uh, brown fields data set. 
And this is in a specific format. This is in the, the format that ESRI creates uh, called the ArcGIS uh, REST interface. So it's in a specific format. And uh, I, can, uh, I, can, I can request this. Right now, I've requested this as just an HTML page. But if I change the question mark, I can say F equals JSON. And then I request it in this format called JSON that it's, it's human readable, but it's, uh, it's actually more readable for a machine. Right? So it's a bunch of uh, values and, I'm uh, sorry, um, it's a bunch of properties and their values. So for this REST endpoint, um, I, can, I can get the current version. I can get the service description. These are all things that a, a computer program would love to have. They read through the information and they could display it. Um, and uh, here we have buttons that will display this REST endpoint this endpoint here in a few different um, clients. So the first one here is called ArcGIS JavaScript. If we hit this, we will see a client that will display those brown fields just on a very basic uh, web map. See that? Uh, I don't even think I can click on those. It's just really, really basic. I can also display it on uh, ArcGIS Online, which we'll talk about. I can display it in ArcGIS uh, Earth. When I click Arc Map, it'll actually download a layer file that I could actually open up in uh, in Arc Map or in uh, in ArcGIS Pro. And then finally, ArcGIS Explorer would uh, also download an NMF file. I don't have ArcGIS Explorer loaded on this machine. I can't I can't display it. Um, but so look here. Here's here's the only layer that's loaded in this map service. If I click on it, I uh, I can get information about what fields this layer has, and I can actually query it. So um, I don't know what the fields are. Let's see, uh, city, longitude. I could say uh, where uh, longitude is greater than 10. That should return all of them, right? Latitude, no. Yeah, latitude. Latitude. Got to spell it exactly right. So then I, then I can say get all the records where latitude is greater than 10. It's going to return all of them. And you can see here that it's returned a bunch of, of records. And if I change the URL slightly, again, changing the format to that JSON format, you can see that I get a, uh, a still human readable, but this would be much better for a machine to read this. This is actually what the, this URL requests this data. And so when I display this in a client, what's happened is it's, requested the data, it gets the data, and it shows that the client then takes this data, reads through it programmatically, and displays that information on the client's map, whether that's a, a web browser or whether it's uh, something like ArcGIS Online. Okay. All right. Has anybody heard the term AJAX before in web development? So AJAX actually stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. This was the next big thing that helped web mapping uh, move into creating slippery maps. And it, it actually helped a lot of things. Uh, who uses a, a webmail client? Like, have you guys ever gone and, and looked at your email on, on the web? Like Gmail is a webmail client, right? Gmail is actually one of the first applications built using this technology. And what it does is it allows web pages to be a lot more interactive because it, 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 can, it can make requests to the server as part of the uh, web page. And it can change parts of the web page based on the requests that it gets. And so 
it can make a request for, for data, and that, uh, that data is then displayed uh, on the map or, or on the form interactively. Okay? So uh, this, was, this was started back in 1996, but it really became mature uh, in, uh, in the early 2000s. So they call it uh, asynchronous JavaScript and XML, but actually AJAX requests uh, typically don't use XML as the standard anymore. They, they typically use JSON uh, as the standard uh, for uh, requesting and utilizing uh, GIS uh, for, for actually any sort of data. So this is how a modern web map uh, looks. This is the, the, the anatomy of a modern web map. We have our web browser, and our web browser makes a request and it gets HTML and JavaScript back. And that JavaScript is then responsible, the code is then responsible for requesting GIS data. That, that GIS data can be content layers. Those are usually vector data that's served up as JSON. And then, or it can be static data, and those are usually served up as images. So, a web map contains images and data. Sometimes that's referred to as a mashup of, of different uh, layers. That's how that works. These, this back part of the of the equation here, the static tiles. That was another major revolution in uh, web mapping, is that we had the ability to uh, take a bunch of data, turn it into to, to map tiles, and put it on the server. And uh, requests could be come in to those individual map tiles, and they would load really, really quickly. That's, that's one reason why, uh, why Google Maps works so well. And, and we have the, the slippery map, is because all the background images, that's these guys, you know, in, in uh, uh, or sorry, my app stuck Google.com. These background images that load up here are already, already running, are already created. Okay, map tiles um, are, are, maps that have already been made. They're sitting on the server, and they have, uh, they've been made for all of the entire world. Terabytes and terabytes of data for a single uh, map like Google Maps for a worldwide coverage. Okay. So this is an example of not a Google map, but a different map tile. And so what we can do is separate out, say, OK, well, we've got all of the, uh, the base map data as tiles. It doesn't require a computer software program running at all. Uh, or a very, very light computer software program. And then we have the uh, base content. I mean, sorry, not the base content. The content layers we can put on top of that. So the content layers are stuff like the, the restaurants or whatever we're, we're trying to find. So we have that separation. Sometimes people think of it like a sandwich. Where we've got uh, our base layers. It's like an open face sandwich, really. Our base layers and then all of the, uh, which is the, the, the bread, and then all of the individual elements uh, of the uh, of the sandwich. Now Google kind of created this. Uh, well, they did uh, create this concept of a uh, uh, of a tiled map layer, and since they did, they set up the the standard for the the size of a map tile, which is 256 by 256. They also um, set up the uh, the projection that it's in, which is. And if you zoom out here, well, at one at some point it actually changes now because the data is so coarse, it's easier to uh, to modify it. So now we get a globe when we zoom out. Uh, that's not true on on all on all services, but um, it is true on some others. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so some web some web mapping programs, uh, some web mapping applications will uh, even load the tiles just outside so that when you pan, it'll very quickly uh, show those. Sometimes we call that a slippery map. Okay. 
So if we were to, to look at all the data that needed to be to, to exist to create uh, tiles for the entire world, it looked like this. So zoomed out, you have one um, you have one tile for the entire world. And as you zoom in, you get more and more 256 by 256 uh, tiles. So at, at uh, zoom four, you already have um, you know a colossal amount of tiles. Think about zooming all the way in. Got thousands and thousands of tiles. So, so webmap programming is about interacting with the uh, URLs and the resources to uh, to create a, a a client, and that's one of the things that we do in the uh, web mapping course. Okay, so the 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 kind of de facto uh, projection for web mapping is called Web Mercator. It's also the de facto uh, like when you first open up ArcGIS Pro, it is the uh, it is the map projection that that uh, you see. So I'm going to create a new map. I'm going to call this Web WebGIS. And when I bring this up. The first map I see, this map is in Web Mercator. So if I zoom out, one of the characteristics of Web Mercator is that uh, the world is a um, a square, almost a perfect square. Actually, it is a perfect square if it's if it's Web, Mer Web Mercator. Right. So this is a single um, image that's 256 by 256 pixels, and as I zoom in. I see new uh, pixels. Okay, I get new information. New, new 256 by 256 uh, uh, images. So um, one of the things that we have to consider is that uh, Web Mercator is uh, it was originally designed uh, for uh, for navigation at sea. Okay. Web, Merc Web Mercator works really well. For figuring out what the compass heading is from traveling from this place to that place, okay? Because we could just get a protractor out and figure out what the angle is there, and that's the that's the compass heading to get from uh, this point to that point. Okay. Um, but uh, area is messed up. That's a, I say pretty bad there. It's, that's probably not proper English. But uh, you can see the area of of uh, Antarctica is just just horribly distorted, along with uh, Greenland. That's really easy. So I can change the base map right here in ArcGIS Pro. All right. Yep. Okay. Um, so, at first, this was thought to be a really big problem, uh, but then now in practice, what's what's happened more often is that uh, uh, because computing power has increased, we can actually we can actually you know, when we make a request for an area to a service, we can design that service. The software that's running behind it can be designed so that when it makes a request for an area, it can com it can it can compute that area. In a different projection, or even think about it as covering the surface of the Earth, you can actually perform the geodetic uh, calculations to uh, to include the curvature of the Earth in the calculation. Uh, so uh, it's not thought of as as big of a problem anymore. Okay. Still, still has the perception problem, the perception issue. If you're looking at this as a, as a worldwide map, uh, you're still going to think. Well, these places are bigger than they really are. Still have that issue. But we don't have the issue where we could draw a polygon here and draw a polygon here and have it tell us the wrong area. We can, we can, we can now have the server compute it in whatever projection we want to and return it back uh, and get that, uh, that information out uh, better than before. All right. Um, 
So, um, yeah, I think we covered this pretty well. The base, uh, base, base map, the tiles on a base map, these are the tiles on a base map. They're, they're all sitting on a server, just waiting to be utilized. Uh, so when you bring up a map, there's a request. And in fact, that's happening here in ArcGIS.com, I mean, sorry, in ArcMap, in ArcGIS Pro. Right? So where is this data that you see right now? Yeah, it's on a server somewhere, uh, one of ESRI's servers. And when I change from um, the dark gate canvas to oceans, let's say, what's happening is I'm requesting a different resource, I'm requesting a different map service, and it's returning back th those tiles. You see how they loaded in as tiles? It's requesting back those tiles instead of the, uh, the original tiles. Okay. So, so same with that. I can switch it, and uh, I get a different set of tiles. So when we layer things like symbols and markles on top, we call those layers or content uh, layers feature layers. So I'm going to show an example of doing that right now. Okay. So um, as a web GIS, I have the ability to add uh, data from web services. So we all know, and we've done, we've said add data to the map. We've done that in this class, right? So I can add local data. But that's not what we're going to focus on today. We can add data from a local path or a URL. So I'm going to hit that. And then I can, I can click, I can put in a URL here. So if I hit, uh, if I go back to my Maris data set, and I click on the rest endpoint for this data set for uh, Brownfields, copy that. Um, URL and paste it into that location and say add, what it does is it, it makes the request, it's actually making this request here without the where clause, it doesn't, right now I'm just, at, I'm just doing that. So it's making that request and it's getting this information, so that information is, is going back to ArcGIS Pro and then ArcGIS Pro is displaying that information. And so where is this data, this Brownfields data? Where is it? Right, exactly. And ArcMap didn't even have this next capability. So now, now that we have this data, we can start to do things with it, right? So um, you, could, you could actually save it out using ArcMap, but now we have the ability. We can actually use this layer here as, uh, as an input to a tool. So we can do analysis with this distributed data that we don't even really have. So we could, uh, we could, we could do a buffer on it. Now this will will this will do it locally. So we could we could input um so the so the other two are external but the one that you're doing now the buffer is uh locally on top of it so but they are different yeah, it's not it's not actually letting me uh, input this. Oh, you know what? Yeah, well, let's try that. Yeah, it's it's not actually letting me input that uh, layer. It doesn't have attributes. It should. No, it doesn't. Add data. Okay, that's what I did wrong. All right, so um, I made a request to the, I, I, I inadvertently made a request to the map service, 
And if I want to get the actual features, I have to tell it which one of those is the, um, which layer I want, because then I'll get the actual features. So this here, what I did was I went to add data, data from a URL, and I copied in and I said slash zero. So I probably could get a better explanation than I could give you by, by clicking this button and reading it. But what I'm doing is saying I want the first layer in this map service, and it returns it as what's called a feature service. So now I can uh, put it as an input uh, to a buffer. So I can find all the uh, areas within five uh, miles of a brownfield uh, location and, uh, and run that. Now, um, it will take a little while longer. It didn't, in this case, take that long. But if I have a very complex data set, because it's making requests to the, the web, there'll be some latency. Okay, Did you see that? Um, so now I have that information. And I also have this, the information of the brownfield location. And the buffer contains all the information that was, that was actually in the, in the website. Now, where is the buffer information stored? The buffer information is stored on the local That's right. Yep. The buffer information is stored on um, the local information, uh, the local place. All right. Okay. So, um, oh, I didn't mean to close that. Well, so that's okay. All right. Um, so that's utilizing some data. ArcGIS has a bunch of data. ArcGIS uh, dot, dot com and. Uh, uh, and there's a bunch of, uh, you know, actually, I was going to talk about RGS comma in a second, so let me hold off on that. All right, so, um, yeah. Well, that's that's what a uh, server does, and so if you want to if you want to share your information, then you have to put it up onto a server, or your computer has to be a server, uh, and uh, yeah. So that's what a web map server is. A web map service is a program that sits on a web map server. It waits for requests and then processes those data. Uh, and returns resources. Okay. Uh, there are other examples of, of web map servers besides ArcGIS server, which is the one that is running here. This is this is our this is uh, created by ArcGIS server. And ArcGIS server controls how I interact with uh, different um, with it. So I it, it it determines the format. But I don't really have to. I don't really have to. Um, know how to interact with it directly through its programming interface, through its REST interface. All I really need to know is that it exists and uh, that, it, that it's there running on the server in order to interact with it using a web GIS, right? So um, our GI, uh, GIS Pro is actually a... Um, is a client, and it's a client that's set up to work with ArcGIS Online. And ArcGIS Online is a cluster of ArcGIS servers. So, um, how many how many of you used ArcGIS Online a little bit, or a lot? Okay, you all have the ability. I don't know if you knew that, but you all have the ability to sign in to ArcGIS. Uh, ArcGIS. Uh, online. So you can sign in and um, you can do all sorts of things in ArcGIS Online. It's a, it's a full-fledged GIS. So here I've got a map and uh, I could um, I can actually add data. The data has to be on a server though. I have to get my data onto a server before I can add it. I, I can only add local data by first getting it up onto a server. 
So I could I could search for layers. These are a bunch of layers in uh, that are that have already been created on ArcGIS Online. Um, but uh, I could uh, add data from the web and then put a URL. I could put that same Brownfields URL in. Add a layer. So now I've got all these uh, these Brownfields. And what a, what a web GIS does that's different from just a web mapping program is it allows me to, to perform uh, GIS analysis. So now I can take these brown fields and I could do the buffer that I showed you before. I can do a, a use proximity, uh, create buffers, right? But let's do a different one. Let's do um, there's, there's drive time analysis. Instead of just saying, I want to find all the areas that are near those brown fields. Let's say I want to find all those areas that are within uh, 10 minutes of drive time to those areas. So let's say toward the facilities. And I'm going to I'm going to dissolve them all into the same polygon, and I'm going to call this uh, 10. I'll call it. Uh, Brownfield, I'll just call it near Brownfield. Okay. All right, include reasonable streets. I'm not sure what that even means. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to run that. And uh, when I do this, where is the processing actually occurring? The processing is coming from your computer? Server. Right, it's the server. So the server is, is compiling all, everything it needs. It has to make a request out to the Mississippi uh, Maris website to get, the, um, to get the points. And then once it gets those points back to the server, it has to then run them, and it's it's actually running the same code that we did earlier, the network an analysis code, but it's running it on the server instead of running it on the client. Um, and then it uh, it's going to show us the result when it finishes. Now, it might take less time or more time. It's still just a computer. So it's still performing that task just like it would take in ArcGIS uh, Pro, it would take a little while to actually uh, to complete this task, and so it still has to to perform. It still has to run the the, the code, um, and then it still has to save the data out somewhere, and then it actually creates a little um, a little map service to share that data out uh, with us. So now it's still running. Um, when that slows down, it is because the computer slows because the resources may not be available to do those computations. So it's taking a little time. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it is gonna it is gonna have to distribute out the uh, the tasks that um, that it the, if if we all make a request at the same time. But hopefully, the computer is robust enough. It's a much better computer than my laptop, and so it's going to be. Uh, running that information through more quickly. <clears throat> my guess is that no, I've, I've never seen it myself. But my guess is that they actually that they actually don't uh, host these services. That there's there's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of cloud service providers nowadays. Amazon is the biggest one, but Microsoft has uh, has a bunch of servers out there uh, where you can you can basically just say, okay, um, I want a computer, and it uh, it provides a computer to you as a service. You can log into the computer, uh, you can install ArcGIS uh, server on the computer, and then you can give it a URL. And uh, it exists, and it's out there. Okay. All right, so 
you see uh, you see these are all the areas that are within five miles of uh, brownfield or within 10 minute drive of brownfields okay right. um, I could add another data set so the living atlas is the um, it's kind of the repository that ArcGIS has created for lots of data. It has census data, like Sarah was talking about earlier. So if I want to find uh, block uh, groups or blocks, see if it'll just if it'll get U.S. Census blocks. So I'm going to add um, U.S. Census blocks to that map. I don't know why it zoomed me into. Uh, um, not sure why it zoomed me into to New York there, but so I've got my U.S. Census blocks added to the data set. If I zoom in, I should be able to see them. Maybe I have to zoom way in. Yeah, there we go. So now I can see my U.S. Census block data right there. Actually, I still can't see it. I guess maybe those are the boundaries. All right. So I've got my U.S. Census block data. And I might want to ask the question, how many people are there within five miles of, or sorry, within 10 minute drive of uh, brownfields in Mississippi? So I can also do an, that analysis. So how would we do that in ArcGIS Pro, by the way? Population. Well, I've got the layer. I've got uh, U.S. Census blocks. I've got, and uh, that's one of the attributes. In fact, I could, if I go back over here, just to just just to clarify this point a bit, um, and I go show item details. Here is the U.S. Census block uh, description page. If I go to the rest URL, actually, I might be able to see it here. No, I, I don't see it. If I go to the uh, the REST service URL here, I can look at the attributes. These are the attributes of um, the uh, of that layer. So there is an attribute called POP100, which I assume means population. I should I should probably verify it if I really wanted to to be good, but I'm pretty sure that's yeah. See, look how it shows up as population on the click. Yeah, yeah. So I could I could uh, do a spatial join. That's that's a that's a good way to do it. So I've got uh, all of those, and I could do a um, a spatial join um, under analysis. I could say manage data. I could I could probably actually do it through overlaying. Uh, I think, but I think under summarized data. So that's this is um, this this is the spatial join uh, way to do it. So if I did summarize within, it's going to do a spatial join and then summarize. So I can I can say summarize within the near brownfields data, and I want to summarize the U.S. Census blocks that are within the near brownfields data. And so what I want to summarize is what? Population count. And I want the sum. Choose a field to group by. Uh, I, I dissolved. I could, I could have if I didn't dissolve these things. Or did I dissolve them? No, I, yeah, I did. I dissolved them all into the same... Um, into the same one, so I can't really uh, choose a group by field. So now I'm going to call this uh, uh, people near brown fields. So it's actually doing a spatial join in the background when I run this, um, and it's going to give me an answer as to how many people live near the brown fields. Now this might take even longer to run. Uh, you know, the, the census blocks are pretty small. But we could wait on that. We could we could come back after the uh, the break and uh, and look at that data later uh, and see what see what the answer is um, to the to the information. Uh, 
Are those brands considered dirty sites? They like wood sites, aren't you? Yes, that's what a, a brownfield is. Uh, here's the information uh, on the on it. That you could you could read more about exactly what constitutes a brownfield. But yeah, it's it's a uh, like you said, it's <clears throat> a site, facility, or plant or location where hazardous substance pollutants or contaminants have been released into the environment. Okay. And basically, there's no way to handle the existing problem. So that's what a brownfield is. All right. Okay, so um, ArcGIS Pro, could have, we could have done all that analysis inside of ArcGIS Pro, but the point is that ArcGIS Online now captures a lot of the same functionality, not all of it. Um, it ArcGIS Pro has still, still got a lot of, of rich... Um, Tools in it, but it it does do a lot of the same uh, of the same tools. Now, what if we had done that in ArcGIS Pro, done that analysis in ArcGIS Pro, and we wanted to create a map? So here is our our map. Let's see, we want to make the base map look different. So do uh, we, go ahead. Can we scale the default based on the density of the population around this site? Scale what? Scale the density of the population around the ground site. Still, I need to make it bigger based on how many is there. The the people population around the very site. Well, I didn't do a population analysis on this layer. I only did it on the web. Oh, okay. But yes, if I had done the same analysis, uh, then I could I could do that. And I, I could actually add that data in um, from a path. I think that's still there. Yep. Um, so here's the census blocks for the whole United States. Um, that this might take a long time to load. I've done that data was already calculated. Could you isn't that local now? No, this I, I entered the URL to those to those census blocks. So uh, yeah, so here's all the census blocks, right? Okay. And uh, yeah, I could do the same. The, the, these buffers are circles, so I could do the same thing where I do the spatial join. And the target features, which are going to get the data, are the brown fields. And the join feature is the census blocks. Uh, and you know we did this before. We're, now we're going to say that we want to do um, population 100. And we want the sum. And I think that should be good. So now we're going to get the sum of the population within that circle and it's going to be output into this uh, output shape file I mean uh, geodatabase and it's running so we're doing almost the same analysis the difference here is that uh, I, I dissolved all the boundaries so that there's only one feature and I did drive time polygons instead of buffers but other than that the the difference is this uh, the differences are uh, are not very, there's not very much difference. It still did the spatial join between those two. Okay. So now uh, this is going to run. Now notice that we're only at 3%. Uh, all right. So when it's done running, and if we wanted to share that map, we wanted to, to display it out onto the web, we could do that. So if you go under, um, if you go under share, there's the ability to share either a web map or a web layer. So we can, sh we can sh uh, share a, uh, a web map using ArcGIS Online. As long as you are logged in to uh, ArcGIS Online, you have the ability to share. And everybody here should, should be set up as a... <coughs> ArcGIS Online has... Sorry. 
<coughs> RGS Online has, uh, I think, four different levels. Uh, they're user, uh, publisher, data, creator, and uh, editor. Or, I'm sorry, and, uh, uh, and administrator. And so you guys are all in that fourth category, the third category, the data, data editor. Third category they listed. So it's above publisher. So you can publish and edit uh, data on RGIS.com. Uh, oh, it, it finished. So now, uh, like uh, Alba suggested, I could uh, display the symbol. Uh, I'm going to do uh, graduated colors and it, the sum of uh, the population there. Huh. Am I on the right? Yeah, brown fields. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. I guess let's look at the census block table and make sure that I was right about uh, P00100. Yeah, P00100 should be the population. So I'm not sure why uh, we didn't get any data in that in that thing. Anyway, um, I'll try to rerun that during the break and figure out figure out what I did wrong because that wasn't part of what I was originally going to do. Um, seems like it should work. Okay. This one finished. Uh, so we could do the same thing. Of course, it's, there's only one polygon. So um, we can't really do anything to symbolize it because I made everything one polygon. But we could inspect it. Like we could, we could click on it and um, we could find out what that population is. Let me, let me turn off everything besides that layer. Okay, so this is the, 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 the brown fields. And so, uh, that's census blocks, summary of census blocks. Sum of population, zero. So something, something went wrong in both cases. I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, but it didn't actually sum them. But, uh, we can figure out why uh, during the break, but uh, but anyway, hey, we, did, we did the analysis, but I must have just selected a wrong option in, in both cases. Uh, I dissolved online. I dissolved the boundary, so it's all one feature. See, when I click on it, it's all of the, you know, all of the features. Well, the, the difference that it makes is that it would give me just one value if I dissolved, which is what it did, or it would give me lots of values um, if I don't dissolve, which is what I did here. So it's... It, I'm basically changing the, if I dissolve, I'm asking the question, how many people live within 10 minutes of every brown field? If I don't dissolve, I'm asking the question, how many people within, live within five miles of each brown field? That's the difference between dissolving and not dissolving. Does that make sense? But do you have to do uh, it before you dissolve? I don't have to. I'm telling you that the difference between not dissolving and dissolving is the difference between those two questions. Like if, if I dissolve, I'm asking, I'm saying, I'm treating them all as one feature. It depends on my question as to whether or not I have to dissolve before or after. Dissolving turns them all into one feature. So when I say, 
tell me the population in this one feature. What that one feature represents is the, the drive time for all of the brown fields. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and take a, uh, let's, let's come back uh, at 115 and uh, I'll figure out what happened. Because when I, I actually did the drive time one before and it worked fine, so I don't know why that didn't work. And this one also didn't work. But let me uh, let me do that and we'll talk about the final project. Your uh, TA.